going to show us even more, faster, broader, and I don't really know what we are going to do. And this is why this book is so important. And this is why the Kaduna State Government will be buying 4,500 copies Because we want to put 10 copies in each of our secondary schools, junior and senior secondary schools, so that our students can begin to read and be curious. Because that's the most important thing you need now in terms of education. You need curiosity. Everything is there. It's online. You just ask Google. You don't need to remember anything don't have to memorize. We were taught by memorization. The smartest of us, those of us that uh, ended up with first class honors, did so because we could memorize uh, very well. But that's no longer necessary. What is needed now is curiosity and the tools to be able to search for information. So, I have said my bit about what the Kadunese government will do as far as this book is concerned. I'm also going to give a personal donation to Jafet that I will not announce. But I'm surprised that this book presentation does not have any rich man. Because you see, the way to do book presentation, maybe this is the digital way. You know, you invite Adi Kodangote to present, to be the chief launcher. Then he will give you a hundred million and you'll be rich. You know, but Jafet is calling poor people and bloggers <laughs> and people on Twitter. Joe Abba is probably the richest man in the room. <laughs> you know, Jafet, you know, I don't know whether the new code of wealth is different from the one we know. But me, when I write my book, oh, I will invite Ali Kodangote, Femi Otedola, Abdul Samad Rabiu. I would have invited Asiwaju, but he doesn't give. <laughs> he has, but he doesn't give. Okay? So, this is, uh, this is the 20th century way of launching books. But the 21st century, you invite poor bloggers and I, I honestly I was looking around for the most famous blogger from Kaduna State who still has a bit of money because for eight years uh, for four years he collected 13.5 million a month but I didn't see him <laughs> anyway Jafet I'm sure you don't want to be rich the analog way maybe there is a digital way to be so let me end I've made you laugh let me end with a more serious thought about polit about youth and politics you know, in Kaduna State, 89% of the population is below the age of 35. I am among the oldest 5% of the population. The oldest. What does that say? It says that I'm too old to be the governor of the state. But as they say in Nigeria, our condition make a fish bend. We have lowered the age the constitutional age of participating in politics. Young people have no excuse anymore. And I want to tell you, and I've said this, and I'll keep saying it over and over, power is not given free of charge. Or as someone said, power is not served a la carte. You have to participate. You have to engage. You have to contribute. You have to add value. It is only then you will sit at the table. It is only then you will be able to take over. Sitting and complaining on Twitter will not take you anywhere. Most of those governing the place don't even read, uh, see, read your tweets anyway. So my appeal to all the young people here is in addition to Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook and all that, please join political parties participate, contribute, be patient. Don't go in with any sense of entitlement. Nobody cares that you're young. We are all young at one time. 
But if you see it and you have a contribution, you'll be listened to. Because the quality of people in politics is not that high. And we need higher quality people like you participating in politics. It's the only way the country will change. It's the only way the country will be better. So I appeal to you, as I always do, please join political parties. And let me give you another piece of advice. Look at all democracies that are maturing. So they all tend towards what? The two-party system. So don't waste your time joining ABC party. Or form your own party. Kaduna Young People's Party. Who cares? Join a real political party that has breadth and presence and grow in it. The PDP and the APC may have its problems. But you know, they are the only parties we have. The others are either associates or shelf parties or waiting to merge with one of the two. The world is moving towards a two-party system. Don't waste your time going to contest on a D A P C N B P. You know, it's a waste of time. So go there. They are not perfect, but when you go in there with your ideas, with your contributions, you can change, you can improve those parties. They are not perfect. I'm a member of APC. I'm one of those that signed. 37 people registered the APC. I was one of the 37. And I'm not saying it is a perfect party. I know that we have a perfect, oh, near perfect president. I love the president. Okay? But take away the president, there are issues. All right? But we are still better. No, no, no. But we are still better than the other alternative. Mm? The other alternative, if you take the worst person in our party, is better than the best person. <laughs> I have not mentioned any names, so don't go and quote me. Now, so, please, please, and please, please be active in politics. Join us to make Nigeria a better place. Thank you very much. the books or the book on behalf of the senator representing Kaduna Central, Senator Obasani, who uh, is unavoidably absent. He was in Kaduna yesterday and something kept him there. Constituency issues, you know, legislators must always relate to their constituencies. Um, we are going to present the book the digital way. As I said, the analog way is to get a rich man. The digital way is to get a struggling governor to do so on behalf of a more prosperous senator. I must say, you know, Uba is more likely to um, do something analog digitally than I. Who are you calling? Mumin, please come. Eh? I just okay, when they head it oh no. Yo. Eh? The richest man in the world. Okay. 
the PDP yesterday. No legislative aid. Oga, Oga, you may come now. Oga, you may please come. We. Senior legislative aid. For those of you that are too young to know, let me introduce, he doesn't like being called chief, so I'll just call him, he's Yomi Edu, he was minister, special duties, under President Olusegun Obasanjo, 1999 to 2003. Okay, some of them don't know you because some of them were not born then. Uh, so, oh, on this, I ask to then the books, you, for the books to be presented. Sorry, I forgot to come to the day's office. Uh, I'm old, I have forgotten. Can I have a copy? There is a book review by Dr. Joe Abba. listen to him, he's a very wise man. He taught me. Who? Oh. Jide. That's Jide's daughter. It's true. I know her. I attended her mom's wedding. Shows how old. That shows how old I am. Okay, um, I think I've done my bit. I've made you laugh a little and troubled a few of you. Um, we have launched the book. May this book be successful. We look forward to the second, third, and fourth books. Don't write more than five, Japheth. Thank you so much. Can we please give His Excellency a round of applause and all our guests, JJ. As we return to our seats, um, I have a special message for everybody. Please pay attention. This is your conscience speaking. How many people can identify with that? Please pay attention. This is your conscience speaking. And that is a very popular um, and frequent opening line that our reviewer uses on Twitter. Just before we listen to the official review of Digital A New Code of Wealth, I'd like to invite a few persons to give a short goodwill message. And I'd like to start with Zara Buhari Ndimi, who is an ambassador for ACE Charity. Zara, can we please have you?
this thing up. Hello? Is that open? I think it skipped. Can I just... Okay. No, it's okay, it's okay. I think it's working. Yeah. Um... There's a lot of socializing going on, so I'll just wait a second. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I really want to have your attention because uh, there's one word that I haven't heard from the beginning of this uh, book presentation. And that is tolerance. We are all very different and we deserve to be who we are while respecting other people as well. But that doesn't mean that when you express yourself, you should attack anyone. That doesn't mean that you should be attacked. That's a huge issue that we have in this country. The inability to accept the difference between us, between each other. We have more than 300 tribes and more than 500 languages. And it explains why we have that. Our population is huge. More than 200 million people, individuals like us, spread around this country. And we're all different. I think it's very important to be able to explore the country, understand it, accept it. We have six geopolitical zones. And this is for a reason. That's because we're not the same. That's why we have different states. With everyone having their own kind of laws that fit the, the special people within that land. And it's very important to recognize that and to accept it and to actually celebrate it. I don't have much to say, but when I think of digital media, these words come up to me. And it's literacy, history, tolerance, numbers, materialism, acceptance, bullying, open-mindedness, self-reflection, and respect. We have to have all these words in mind while we're interacting with people. You're not the only one. You're not the only special person. Every single person in this room is special, and you need to recognize that. Please clap for yourself for just being special. <laughs> and this book, I, I haven't read it. I wouldn't lie that I've read it, um, but it has created something for us, something, um, something specially tailored for Nigerians to read, which usually we don't have. Everything we adopt from the outside and read it and accept it just the way it's been done and presented to us. Thank you, Omojo, for doing that. Um, I would like to correct something, actually. I was presented as Zara behind me and then Zara Homes. I'm actually ZMB Homes and it's not a company of some sort. It's a, it's a charity organization that takes care of orphaned children and vulnerable children. So they could be orphans and they could be vulnerable but with both parents. It doesn't matter. And we are looking at an estimated number of 17 million children out of 200 million people. Nigeria. That's a huge number. And as I remember, Chioma um, explained that uh, there are three, 30, 30 million children out of school. So that makes up for more than half of the children. They're actually out of school because they cannot do it at all, even with the government. I think we understand the situation. And um, another question we need to ask ourselves is, what has made us so unforgiving and so intolerant? We all have history, we understand that. Don't shy away from history, learn from it. When you understand the reasons why conflict has risen, then if you know why it's happened, then you're avoiding it in the future. I think that's very, very important. And having the heart to actually forgive from within your heart, not just from your tongue, because some people will just be like, yeah, I forgive you, that's it. But then they're actually planning something. They're planning your downfall one way or another. And that's, that's being Nigerian, actually. 
we, we don't say what we mean all the time. But it's, it's, I think it's something we need to, pr we need to repair from within. We need to be, ha we are happy people, we need to be happy from within. And please don't hate progress for anyone because I remember a quote and it goes as, love what you want for yourself, for your neighbor. Love for your neighbor, what you love for yourself. I'm, I'm bad with that. And that's very important. And you would see good things coming to you. But here, all we see is the constant blocking of progress. Constantly. And while I was sat there, someone was telling me how there was no synergy between people. Just to, you, you have no idea how many people are going to benefit from what you are going to let happen. And it's going to be a ripple effect and it's going to come back to you. So please, if you don't have a percentage in it, don't make a big fuss. Think about the other people. Let it happen. And Omojua, thank you so much for creating this book because it has, it, it's a thought-provoking opportunity for many people in this room. And I'd like to thank you so much on behalf of the whole, our generation, for doing this. Thank you so much. Founder of Zara Homes and Ambassador for East Charity. Let's please give another round of applause to Zara Buhari and Dimi. Thank you so much for those kind words. Now it's time to listen to the official review. Uh, gives me great pleasure. Some people know him as the Eze Moore of Twitter. Others know him as the conscience. Can we welcome Dr. Joe Abba, his country director, Dai. Please listen, this is your conscience about to speak. Your Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Your Excellency, the First Lady of Kaduna State, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My boss, uh, Dr. Jim Bunga, the President and CEO of DAI Global, recently said to me, Joe, you have almost a quarter of a million followers on Twitter. Have you figured out how to make money from that stuff? I told him, I just tweet my mind. I've never actually thought about making money from it. I said I've occasionally used the following that I have to promote people's businesses, but I've never charged them any money for doing so. However, uh, quite a number of people have given me gifts, and when I publicly thank them, they say they've got no business. But I also told Jim that one of Africa's best known authorities on the subject, J.J. Omojua, has just written a book on it, and that I'll order a copy for him. And as I was reflecting further on uh, Jim's question, uh, J.J. himself then asked if I could find time to review the book for him. Apart from being proud to have been given this honor, Accepting to review the book is perhaps the best way of ensuring that I actually read it. The foreword uh, to the book was written by my friend, the brilliant Dr. Aloy Chife, whom I attended the University of Calabar with, together with Ruben Abati, who were three of the youngest in our year at UNICA. Both Aloy and Ruben made first class degrees, while I only managed to make a 2 2. My well known excuse is that it is because I read law. You need a higher jump score to be admitted to read law. And the course is infinitely more difficult than the theatre arts, which Ruben read, and the history, which Aloy read. To buttress my point, 
I suspect that I'm one of only a few people that was able to read Alois Forward to a modular's book without checking the meaning of any of the words he carried. But moving on to Unica, myself, Aloy, and Ruben all now have PhD degrees. As we see on Niger social media, we die here. The introductory chapter sets out the book's raison d'etre. For me as a development practitioner, these four pages represent the kernel of the book. Very early on, he puts his finger right on the problem of Africa. However, in the rush to get to the meat of the book about how to make money from all this digital stuff, the reader is likely to miss it. As the author points out in only the third paragraph of the book, Africa's problem is the inability to take good things to scale. This resonates immediately with me because the question of how to take good things to scale in difficult operating environments has been my life's work. It is why the topic of my PhD dissertation is strong organizations in weak states, atypical public sector performance in dysfunctional environments. It is why I accepted a call to serve Nigeria as Director General of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms between 2013 and 2017, and why I left after one term. It is also why I've written on pockets of effectiveness in Nigerian public service and lessons for accelerating national development. In the same vein, I've additionally written an article called Africa has too many pilots, none of them taken off. Of course, I was not talking about aircraft pilots, but about our usual penchant for undertaking experiments, often within the cellular laboratory of donor processes and the cushion of donor funding, which we then fail or, or are unable to take to scale given our political economy. I've made the point that Africa cannot pilot itself out of poverty, and that we must instead focus on the levers that can accelerate our development and prosperity. One of the most important of those levers is digital technology, the subject of Omojua's book. Chapter one plots the author's digital journey from basic computer awareness to his own website omojua.com to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and others. It also starts to speak to the beginning of the activism that the author is also known for, ranging from charitable courses to demanding to be treated well as a paying customer to demanding better government. My own digital journey, particularly on Twitter, came out of need. I was leading a federal government agency that had very little funding. I could not afford to sponsor slots on television and radio like some juicy agencies such as the Nigerian Post Authority. Sorry, Adiza. But I needed to get my story out there and to find ways to engage with the public. But as the author says in the book, and I quote, if you are strategic with your use of social media and other digital platforms, your journey will not only be more interesting, you will achieve your goals a lot faster, end of quote. I can testify that social media certainly held the profile of the agency I was running and helped the public to see government officials as normal human beings rather than empty-headed aliens who do no work and are solely preoccupied with stealing government funds. Being the first ever government official to defend my budget on social media and me perhaps the ultimate accolade a government official can get on social media, which is, I quote, 
is all right. I can testify that the journey has certainly been interesting. I started reading law at a young age, and so through studying criminal law, I was exposed to how hatred, jealousy, anger, and greed could condition human behavior. In criminal law, though, unless the person is a psychopath, you could always see a motive for criminal behavior. The usual, the usual motives are money, power, or sex. However, until I came on social media, I didn't realize that someone you didn't know and have never met, never engaged with, could just hate you for no reason at all. I didn't realize that people can confess, I quote, I just hate that guy. I don't know why. And yet, they'll obsess about you daily, opening new accounts every time you block the handles they harass you with, just to continue seeing what you write so they can continue to rain abuse on you daily. I didn't realize that people could actually proactively block you so that you don't get to see the nasty things they say about you. I was blissfully ignorant and naive. I didn't realize that, as we say in Nigeria, many people are not well. The author talks about the need to do education differently. He laments rightly that, and I quote, our schools are essentially providing answers to old questions when the economy is asking new questions, end of quote. As the author said in the introductory chapter, and I quote again, access to education can be scaled by disrupting the pathways to access education. My friend Chichi Anyagolo Okoye helped to pioneer something called radio school, a means through which people could take lessons over the radio while waiting for customers in their shops or while working in their farms. Uh, DAI's Women for Health program that works in northern Nigeria has put technical information on phones for health workers using the open source learning platform Moodle. It doesn't require internet access and has seen a dramatic rise in the accuracy of diagnosis and the appropriateness of treatment. Chapter 1 concludes by encouraging people to take the leap without waiting for government. Many people do not know that the Indian technology phenomenon, I was going to use the word revolution, but the Indian technology phenomenon started outside government, and that government came into the mix much, much later. We are seeing a similar movement in many tech hubs in Nigeria today. The Indians were targeting Silicon Valley, our companies like Andela, Semicolon, and others, and others are doing similar things in Nigeria. As the author says, we need to start thinking about education in a different way. Education not for the sake of certificates, but for the sake of useful and usable knowledge. And just like the author, my interactions on social media has driven me to the study of behavioral science. I'm learning behavioral science, philosophy, and psychology on my own and for my own personal development, not for the purpose of my CV. I probably should remember to include in my CV that I was awarded a certificate in behavioral science in 2017 by Harvard University a fact that I often forget. We need to move beyond certificates, but when we get them, you must excuse us for flexing. Chapter two discusses becoming a person of influence 
It contains very interesting topics like using social media to influence and persuade, how to build an online following, how to create popular content. It also talks about leveraging digital for social good and dealing with quote unquote trolls. Trolls are usually faceless people hiding behind anonymous handles and their sole purpose in life appears to be to look for ways to get you angry. I think the author will share some nuggets of gold in this chapter that will help anyone desirous of becoming a, a person of influence and surviving the jungle that is social media. Chapter 3 covers digital activism, activism and advocacy. I found this particularly interesting, especially as I do not consider myself at all an activist. Like the author though, I too have had a run-in with Eric Eyre. Our 5 p.m. flight from Lagos to Abuja did not take off until 1 a.m. the next day. There was no explanation and no refreshments for passengers. I wrote a final complaint to the airline, to the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. I took it up with the Ministry of Transport, started an online petition to force the chief executive of the airline to step down and trended the hashtag don't fly Eric for one week until, until it was picked up and published by an international aviation magazine. Of course, my mother in the village got phone calls to ask her son to back off because what, she was fight, what he was fighting was bigger than him. Uh, all I ever wanted was an apology and some compensation. I'm pleased to announce that I got both. The chapter covers the activities of many people I respect, like Buki Shonibare, and many advocacy activities that I am supportive of, like the Not Too Young to Run campaign. The chapter aptly demonstrates how social, value, social media can be a, a, a force for positive social change. Chapter 4 discusses digital government, an area of interest for me as well. It demonstrates how countries like Mauritius and Kenya have leveraged e-government to accelerate their development. It recognizes the benefits of e-government in Nigeria in such areas as the management of the federal government payroll uh, to remove more than 80,000 ghost workers saving billions of Naira. Linking the payroll system to the bank verification number through matching fingerprints has exposed another 40,000 or so multiple payees. These are not ghost workers. These are people that exist, but they are existing government workers collecting more than one salary. In one case, one government official was collecting 20 salaries. The link with the BVN means that for the first time, government can tell who is collecting the cash from the creation of ghost workers and prosecute them. And I'm pleased that a number of them are currently undergoing prosecution. Chapter 5 deals with digital uh, business and tells in a very accessible way the stories of many people that have started or accelerated their businesses using digital technology. From Linda Ikeji to Aki Alabi of Nara Bet to Sterling Bank and many others. There's something to learn in how each person or organization has benefited from digital business. It should give any aspiring entrepreneur a lot to think about. I'm certainly think, thinking about it uh, for the future. Chapter 6 focuses on communicating faith in a digital world. It talks about how several faith-based organizations have leveraged digital technology to advance their objectives. Interestingly, it has a section titled, The Bible is a Threat. And if you've read the Quran like I have, you'll also notice that it is, it is a continuous threat uh, all the way through. The chapter highlights 
the way that churches like the Day Star Christian Center have used technology to disseminate digital lessons. Incidentally, I look forward to speaking at the Data at the Day Star Christian Center's Excellence in Leadership Conference this November. The chapter also highlights the influence of the Zimbabwean Muslim scholar, Dr. Ismail Ibn Musa Menk, popularly known as Mufti Menk. I follow Mufti Menk quite closely, and I think is extremely profound and quite interesting. I think his wisdom may not only be as a result of diligent study, but may also be divinely inspired. He just says his mind. He, he doesn't argue with anybody. He doesn't respond to anything that anybody says. He just says his mind. His Twitter account has 4.6 million followers. But for nearly eight years, he was not following anybody back. The one person he started following about a year ago now is the president of his country, Zimbabwe. The president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, follows 93 people. Mufti Menk is not one of them. That's life. Chapter 7 discusses contemporary culture and music business in a data-driven world, including how artists and musical out outfits have leveraged digital technology to advance their arts. Chapter 8 focuses on cyber security, data protection, and threats in a digital world. Let me just say that I commenced the process of deleting my direct messages on Twitter the day I learned that the account of Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, had been hacked. Chapter 9 on the digital economy and the future of Africa is an area that I have great interest in. From startups in what we call Yaba Kong Valley, our own Silicon Valley in Yaba, to mobile money and digital financial inclusion, the chapter sets out the opportunities for wealth creation and growth in Africa. The book ends with a challenge to us all, but retains the spirit of optimism that is palpable throughout the text. The author says, and I quote, we know what to do. Generations unborn will not forgive us if we do nothing. They will think us people of little ambition if we barely scratch the surface. But they will have our names written in gold if we unleash the prosperity and opportunities that we know we can. Overall, I think that the author has done justice to a very wide-ranging topic. The writing style is engaging and deploys a mixture of excellent personal story storytelling, rigorous research, and prudent analysis. Throughout the book, there are examples.